two, one. And liftoff, liftoff of the Soyuz 29 spacecraft that is taking Don Pettit, Oleg Kononenko, and Andre Kuypers to the International Space Station. shaking hands and congratulations of a successful launch into orbit. Just seven meters away from docking, standing by for contact and capture of the International Space Station. There we are. In space, it's a dangerous and beautiful but intriguing environment. And the first question is, of course, why do we go there? Well, of course, people have the urge to explore. We always did that. We are made for one times gravity, one time atmospheric pressure, five kilometers an hour on our own legs. These are our specifications, and we don't belong on many places on the Earth. But we have the ability, we have our brains, and we can go to places where we don't belong. Why do we do this? Well, we go to the South Pole, for example, because people want to be the first. People risk their lives to go to this place. For all kinds of reasons, it can be power, religion, it can be trade, it can be science, like the voyage of the Beagle. All kinds of reasons why people go to a place where we don't belong. Space is the next step. You need different kinds of people to go to these strange places, to do new things. You need dreamers. You need people who think of strange ideas. Then you need the scientists. In spaceflight, this was Tsiolkovsky. He thought of the rocket principle. It was on paper, so you still don't have anything. You need technicians, you need the engineers. Godard was this for space flight. And he was one of the first who really b was building a rocket. And then you need the daredevils. Well, you know, Yuri Gagarin was the first. These are the people who go in a balloon, who go in a ship. Beside him, Korolyov, the mastermind of, uh, of the Russian space program. Why did I want to become an astronaut? I wanted to, to see the, 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 uh, the Earth from outer space. I was intrigued by these sharp pictures, sharp images of cars on the moon. I got science fiction books from my grandmother, and I thought, this is great. It was the childhood's dream. Then I saw pictures of, uh, of the Earth from the space shuttle, saw the IMAX uh, movies, and I thought, wow, this is beautiful. And then I realized that it was very useful, that we did a lot of science in space. And I thought, okay, this is it. It's adventurous, it's beautiful, and it's very useful. And uh, I wanted to become an astronaut. Now, there I was. So how, do I, how did I get there in space? In nine minutes, you are already in space, and uh, you are at an altitude of 250 kilometers. If you go straight up, you would go straight down. The Earth pulls you back. So the trick is that you don't go straight up, but you go up and then to the east, and you build up a speed of eight kilometers a second. With that speed, you constantly fall around the planet, and that's the whole trick. The space environment is a place which is dangerous. There are, of course, temperature differences, of minus 150 to plus 150 degrees. There's a vacuum. You have to, do to deal with G-forces. You have to deal with vibrations. Uh, you have to do with radiation. Here you see the northern light as a proof of the radiation. Atomic ex uh, oxygen. So there's a lot, a lot of dangerous uh, uh, constraints if you go to space. If something has to work in space, it has to be good. That means that there are thousands of people who really make that, uh, that, make that work. Even more dangerous is to return. Going up is exciting, returning even more. Because you have a speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour, and you don't have a big rocket to reduce that speed. So if you go back to the atmosphere, you have to break like a duck on the water in the atmosphere. So you reduce your speed by friction. That becomes very hot. So that's why you need a heat shield. You're going through the atmosphere like a fireball. You become five times as heavy. So returning from space, re-entry, is even much more risky than, uh, than going up there. Now, space itself uh, is a difficult place. It's difficult uh, to, uh, to make it happen. And it only happens because there are thousands of people thinking about it and working on it. Of course, you need the visionary people. You need the politicians who want to put in the money. You need the, the, the management to make this all work and make it all happen. You need the scientists, the engineers, the technicians, all the support people. I love the expression that astronauts are standing on the shoulders of giants. That's absolutely a true statement. Now, once in space, you have a fantastic 
uh, station environment, you are weightless. There's no up and down. It can be pretty confusing. It's an environment where you can come in the module and think, I've not been here before. And why do you have limbs on the floor? Well, it turned out that you came in upside down. Your vestibular organ doesn't, doesn't notice it because there's no up and down. So it's all visual. What you see, that's the floor. It's an environment that, that makes you, uh, yeah, you can float around. It, uh, it's an environment where you can say, uh, uh, there's funny situations that you want to use an electric screwdriver. Uh, but if you don't fix yourself, it's you that's going to turn instead of the screw. <laughs> so you have to really get used to it. It's an environment where you lose things easily. It's an environment where uh, you have to put on a vacuum cleaner to use the toilet, otherwise things don't go to the right place. It's an environment where things don't drop on the floor. If you lose something like a picture of your daughter or some raisins that you played with, you find it back a few days later at the inlet of a ventilation system. So it's really, you have to get used to this strange environment. And floating itself is very nice. The first day is not, but afterwards it's a very pleasure, uh, 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 pleasant uh, experiment, experience. And uh, the experiments we do have to do, of course, with all the weightless conditions. You can work also on the ceiling, for example. Uh, there is no up and down. So uh, you have to fix yourself if you have to, uh, to uh, run on the treadmill. If you don't do that, you float off. Shoes, well, you don't need shoes in space. You even lose all the callus under your feet. And uh, you can play with your shoes afterwards. Swimming, <laughs> swimming doesn't work. So you can, uh, can forget that, but it's fun to do. And of course, the fun thing is to play. Play with microgravity, play with weightlessness. And uh, what is more fun than eating your, uh, your, uh, your food in, uh, in weightless conditions or drinking it just from the air? <laughs> and how about washing yourself? Well. <laughs> So being in space is pleasant. It's, it's fun to float. You need to, some practice, of course, otherwise you get into trouble with all the cables around you. But after a while, it's a, it's a great environment, and I can advise that to everybody. Go and float every day. I would love to do that every day. But it's also it's not good for your body. We run not for fun, but because we lose muscle, we lose bone, we lose body uh, fluids, uh, less uh, circulating volume of, of blood, your heart muscle becomes weaker. So it's a dangerous place, so that's why we have to do sports to stay in shape. What do astronauts do? Well, they do all kinds of things, a lot of experiments, a lot of repairs, but imagine you're done with your work, you are in the Columbus module, you float out, go to the left, pass your sleeping module, go to the US lab, be careful that you don't pull cables, you can in, come in note one, uh, your colleague is making lunch, you turn right, you go to node 3, this is our gym with the treadmill and, uh, and uh, other equipment, and then in the end you see a little hole there. And this is where the cupola is. This is a favorite place for all the astronauts because that's where the windows are. And you have, it's a watchtower, so you have windows 360 degrees around and on top, and then you can see the whole planet. And it's awesome. Every day, it was great to see, for example, the turquoise waters of the Bahamas. Or you see the roof, the, the roof of the world. This is Tibet. You see the Himalaya mountains. Uh, the outback of Australia, beautiful colors. It's really fantastic to watch, uh, to watch the Earth, and especially at night. Here we fly over the Sahara. You see the lights around, uh, along the Nile River. And, uh, and here we have Holland. You see Zwolle already. It's over there. Here we have Amsterdam, Rotterdam, <laughs> Utrecht. A lot of lights on the planet. It's fantastic to, uh, to watch uh, out the window. Now the future. What is the future going to bring? Space flight will continue. The space station will continue. There's no shuttle. The Americans are working on the Orion pr program, so there will be new spacecraft. There will be a spacecraft going to the station, but also to the moon. Who will be the first on the moon? Maybe the Chinese. Americans and Europeans might go to the moon. Maybe the Americans go to, uh, to asteroids. Uh, but this, this will all happen in the, in the coming years. But it's not only the agencies who explore further and further out into space, but also private companies, commercial companies. In my uh, flight, we, we docked, uh, we berthed the first commercial cargo ship. And that will continue. There's, uh, this is company SpaceX. They will have Companies like Orbital, there will be the developments like the Dream Chaser, but also private space flight will start because people want to go themselves. You can buy a ticket for 30 million with the Russians, but suborbital flights, that's going to be interesting. It's only 200 kilometers, the edge of space, and you're only weightless for five minutes, but 
you can go. You can go to a place where a lot of people have not been before, and you can experience it, have a peek into space. So these developments will, uh, will continue, and in the coming years. And then, of course, Mars. Very important. Everybody wrote about it. There's a lot of movies about it. Mars is intriguing. People are, are, are drawn into, into Mars. What, what is there? You, you can go there. There's robots running around there. We know a lot about Mars. But it's a long trip. It's a dangerous trip. You're not protected by the magnetic field of the Earth. So there's a lot of radiation on the way. It takes you many, many months to go there. And if you're there, I mean, there's a lot of uh, initiatives going on now. It, it's a dangerous environment. The Mars environment is also not uh, very pleasant. Uh, there are ideas now to send a couple uh, ar around Mars without landing. Two people for, more, for about two years. I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, there are ideas to go there and stay there. But Mars is a very harsh uh, planet. There is no oxygen. There is no water. You cannot. Uh, you have to, 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 br to bring everything. You have to create your own oxygen, find your water. Everything has to work. So it, it will be a long, long process before people can do it. But it will happen. There will be people going to Mars. Uh, we will see a colonization of Mars, but it's a long and slow process. We get new technologies, and that's, of course, the, the, the big hope for the future. Iron engines, for example. And you can go faster. There are ideas of going with, uh, with solar sails. So all kinds of new technologies, technologies that we can even think of today that make it much easier to go to space and to use space for, uh, for, uh, for our benefit. Now, if you cannot go there physically, you can, you can watch. We have the Hubble Space Telescope, we have now the Kepler Telescope, and I hope that in the coming years, before 2030, we find Earth-like planets. I think that would be the greatest thing, and even greater maybe, is if we find evidence for life in the universe. I think that will be the greatest invention of, uh, or discovery uh, for, uh, for humankind. And so we will explore further and further in the universe, and uh, uh, to, we, we find uh, other planets, and uh, who knows what will happen with new technologies. And, well, maybe the fact that we want to explore, that we want to, to, uh, to go out in the universe and colonize the universe, maybe it's an evolutionary process. If you are a species that only lives in one habitat, like the dodo, well, that's not a good future. And, uh, and we see on our habitat, our only habitat, the Earth, I see impact craters here. There is one in Quebec. Recently, there was one in Russia for coming down. Uh, and we know our, uh, our uh, friends, the dinosaurs, well, they didn't make it. So it might be a good evolutionary thing for us to spread out, first to Mars and who knows further. But in that process, uh, we should not forget our own planet. At the moment, we are standing uh, with our toes in an ocean of, uh, uh, to be discovered. I love, I love that comparison. So uh, we are only in, in low Earth orbit, we're only with our toes in the water, and there's an ocean to discover. But we should not forget our own planet if we venture out there. With Apollo 8, we started to realize that our planet was really, uh, we started to feel it, that our, uh, our planet was a fragile blue uh, globe. And we have to take care of it, because we're growing, we're growing. 100,000 people per day. So in 2030, we will have 9 billion people on this planet. When I started my space dream, there was only 3 billion. So we have to be careful, because we are using this planet up. We like a plague. Uh, these are all fishing ships, a lot of fishing ships. I can see deforestation from space. You see pollution, you see erosion, like here. So we have to be careful. We are not in an equilibrium with our own planet. And that's a, that's a, 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 a difficult position that we are in. I can see things with my eyes, but we have great satellites that we use for that. Earth observation satellites can give us the data, can, can quantify what, what, we, uh, what we're doing with our planet. We see the air pollution. Well, we're not in a good place here. But, uh, uh, we can see the hole in the ozone layer, and we have very good instruments, and we watch out for our planet, and now it's our task to do something about it. Do we want our planet to become one big city, as we see in many science fiction movies, or do we want to share our planet and keep the nature and, and share it with, uh, with other species that are also living on this planet? I think we have a great planet. I would love to go there now and then, and I think many people shall, will go into space, <coughs> And they will go there to float, to play, to do scientific experiments for the progress of mankind. But I think the most important thing is that they will gaze in admiration to our beautiful planet. 
I think we should go into space and explore and go further and further out, but be careful with our own planet because it's the only one we have.